Good evening, everyone. And welcome. Uh, my name is Bob Lemieux. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science at uh, the University of Waterloo. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to uh, the Bridges Lecture. Um, I'll be your moder I'll be the moderator for uh, tonight's presentation, so we'll have a question and answer period after the, uh, the lecture. I'll be moderating that. So the Bridges Lecture series aims to foster uh, discussions across disciplines between mathematics, science, arts, and the humanities. Uh, it's designed to bring us all out of our intellectual comfort zones in a nice and non-threatening way. Um, building bridges is, is critical. Uh, building bridges between uh, disciplines. And it's ironic that in a university setting, um, this is a very difficult thing to do. Universities are uh, structured in faculties and faculties and departments. And often departments are very isolated, work in silos, and, and, and people have a difficult time uh, talking to faculty in other disciplines. And I think the role of this lecture series is really to break down those silos uh, and, and to create those bridges between disciplines that is so critical. And critical not in terms just of understanding um, scholarly activities as a whole, but also because discovery and innovation often occurs at the interface between disciplines. And that is why this is so important, what we are doing tonight. This is the sixth year of the series. Um, it's a series that is a joint effort of the University of Waterloo Faculties of Mathematics, Science, and Art, as well as St. Jerome's University and the Fields Institute. Um, I'm pleased to, uh, for the Faculty of Science to uh, be represented this year. This is the first year uh, that we are a, an active participant uh, in uh, this lecture series. and. Uh, I think that it is, is very fitting that uh, science be uh, one of the players here. So uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, talking because I really want to give as much time to our speakers uh, tonight. So let me uh, introduce our, speaker, our speakers for tonight's lecture that is entitled Making Math Visible. We have two speakers. They'll be uh, working as a team. The first is George Hart. He is a sculptor and applied mathematician who demonstrates how mathematics is cool and creative in ways you might not have expected. Whether he's slicing a bagel in two linked halves or linking hundreds of participants in an intricate geometric sculpture barn raising, he always finds original ways to share the beauty of mathematical thinking. An interdepartmental research professor at Stony Brook University. He holds a BS in mathematics and a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. His background in math, engineering, and education has enabled him to design many hands on activities, some of which you will have an opportunity to work with, and to lead workshops around the world. Our other speaker is Elizabeth Heathfield. She's a certified teacher and an artist with in-depth experience running math workshops at the middle and elementary school levels. She's interested in exploring the connections between math and art and how hands-on construction activities can change children's mindsets about mathematics. Elizabeth has a BA in visual art from OCAD University a B.Ed. from Lakehead University and an M.A. from Norwich University of Art. She's also a practicing artist whose work has been exhibited in Canada, England, Italy, and the U.S. and has taught fine art classes at various institutions in Ontario. So please join me in welcoming George and Elizabeth to give their lecture.
Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, I won the coin flip, so I get to go first. Um, I'm Joe Chart, and uh, it says here that we're talking about making math visible, and what we brought here is sort of a, an introduction to that. Um, we're really going to talk about sort of educational, hands-on things that uh, we've designed and developed as workshops uh, that get people excited about math, that we think can get people to realize that math is fun and creative. And we'll, we've been working on this for about three years, uh, our plan for today is to first tell you a little bit about ourselves, then to tell you a bit about how we've been working together and what our philosophy is, uh, and then we're going to have you guys build something. So we have something we're going to hand out uh, for you to build, and this is a complete experiment. We haven't done this workshop with anyone. Like, we try out new things. It's research. So you're a part of our research to see if this actually works. We also don't know how long it takes or how easy or hard it is, so we don't know if you're going to succeed. It may take two hours, or maybe we're done in 30 30 seconds and then we're going to have to improvise a lot. Anyway, so that's the plan for today. Um, I think uh, in terms of us telling you a little bit about ourselves, we'll let Elizabeth go first. Uh -huh. So I'm Elizabeth Heathfield. I'm a teacher with the Blue Water District School Board and New Orleans Sound. Um, I teach grade 1, 2 at the moment, but I've taught anything from grade 1 to grade 8. Um, my background is in visual arts. I'm mostly a painter. Um, I studied in Florence in the UK. And I'm really interested in materials, traditional methods of, of painting, even though my work is very abstract. Um, I'm, I'm really comfortable with abstraction, and I think that's one of the things that's helped me understand George and maybe feel comfortable with mathematics that I don't understand and that is too difficult for me um, and I think that's something that's really important for students to see that there's beauty in mathematics and and the fact that you don't understand it yet doesn't mean that you have to be afraid of it um, it's like a language you can appreciate the beauty of it without having to understand it necessarily you know that one day you may understand it you might choose to to um, to continue your studies and understand it, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can appreciate its beauty. Um, uh, I do pastel works at the moment, and uh, this is my classroom. I see teaching very much as an art form. I think the beginning of the year is always like a blank canvas that you can start adding things to. I think in teachers' college, they always tell you don't reinvent the wheel. You know, keep all your notes, and and you'll you know have it. it'll get easier every year. But I think it's good to reinvent the wheel every year and to to work with what you've got. All your students are different every year, and it's nice to start with a blank canvas and and. Um, yeah, add color as you go. Um, so hanging out with George, I've met a few mathematicians and I've noticed that they're very much like my grade with one students in the way that they play with things. Um, they love to make things and they spend a lot of time making things and they learn through tactile exploration and uh, and visualization and, and that's something really important that students lose after a while and and I think you know I, I always ask myself how can we hold on to that so in my classroom they, they play a lot they explore a lot with manipulatives um, we have a lot of puzzles some of them are here tonight I hope people play with them afterwards I think puzzles are wonderful for promoting um, um, intrinsic motivation. Kids get that aha moment after sticking with a puzzle, and that's just so valuable for, for their studies in math or in anything else. And, um, and they come back to the same puzzles, I find, week after week, and they really have persistence, and they develop that persistence. And once they have that aha moment, they're hooked and they keep going. So um, this is a puzzle for me. I, I uh, have deskless Fridays. I get rid of all the desks and chairs every Friday and I try to teach in a way that doesn't require paper and pencil. And, um, and it's always a challenge. We have a great big room then and it's like a gym. And what do you do and how do you teach the things that you have to teach when you don't have the traditional 
you know, set up. Um, here is an example of something the kids did. Uh, we had strawberry baskets donated to the classroom, about 300 of them, and they started building this tower um, just spontaneously, and then they wanted an opening to the tower, so they had to rethink it. Um, and we also have engineering as a subject. Um, so they love to think of themselves as, as young engineers, and I, I love that about them. So um, we have tasks and problems they have to solve by using materials that they find around the classroom. In this case, they were making a roller coaster with um, insulation pipes. Um, I also run a STEAM club after school. STEAM is like STEM, but with art in it, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, and I, I teach in an area um, that um, where the kids don't necessarily get to go to the science center, they were pretty remote, and and a lot of those children will probably stay in in that town for the rest of their life. So I really try and and um, foster a math culture around the school, around the community, and um, here, you know, kids from grade one to eight come together and build cool things together and. Um, I also have a math cafe at lunchtime, and that's more of an informal hangout that kids can come to with their ideas, you know, um, something they might not be doing in math class that they're interested in. Yep, they're making the hyperboloid there. But it's wonderful to see that they're actually willing to bring their lunch, not go outside, not go play sports. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but, <laughs> but it normalizes math, you know, in a way like basketball or hockey. You know, they, they come and and have fun with it, and um, I really love seeing that. Um, George. <laughs> okay, so uh, Elizabeth is from education and art. Uh, I come from a much more technical background, uh, mathematics, electrical engineering, computer science. Um, but my passion, what I mostly do, is I create sculpture. Um, and I'm wondering, if the house lights are a little bit lower, would it be easier to see the, the pictures yeah. on the wall? I don't know. Yeah. It just seems they're a little washed out. But um, uh, I like creating mathematical things that show uh, how mathematicians think in some sense, in some physical form. Um, I work with all different materials. This is a stainless steel sculpture, five feet in diameter. I work constructively, uh, designing things so the pieces have to be assembled. Um, many of the sculptures that I do are assembled by what I call a, a sculpture barn raising. So I take the pieces, I bring them somewhere, and I invite the community to help me put them together. Uh, so here you can see uh, students working all day putting thousands of pieces together to make uh, a large metal sculpture. Um, so this idea of taking things that I think are beautiful as a mathematician and trying to translate them into some tactile visual form is sort of my passion and uh, what we're talking about today is sort of translating that uh, to classrooms and people who want to do that. I like the challenge of different materials. This is acrylic. Uh, this is wood. Um, recently I've done a lot with laser cut wood and uh, cable ties. So it's a fairly cost effective way to cut wood pieces and then you can bring them, they can be very accurate, and then the group has to assemble them to make a sculpture. Um, paper is another good material. Uh, I work a lot with 3D printing, so I can, with a 3D printer, make things that are much more intricate and much more accurate than anything I can make you know, using my hands. Um, this is the bagel cut you heard of earlier, but uh, if you've never done this, take a bagel and figure out how you can cut it into two congruent pieces, but the two loops, instead of coming apart, are linked, like two links of a chain. It's a fun thing to do if you give up. It's uh, on my website. Um, so most of my uh, clients, so to speak, the people who I directly worked with, that looks great, thank you, um, over the past um, 10 or more years have been universities and private high schools. That's just worked out where they, they have money and interest to bring me in. Um, this is a workshop at a high school where we're cutting, we have, there's a saw there, cutting out cardboard pieces in the back, they're putting them together to make a giant sculpture. Uh, oops. Four hours later, we have two sculptures, they're each about uh, two meters in diameter, they're mirror images, um, made out of cardboard, very large and impressive while fairly inexpensive. Same idea with uh, wood and cable ties, uh, building a large sculpture, that's about a meter and a half in diameter. Thank you. 
Um, I've worked a lot with uh, teachers. This is a group called uh, Math for America in New York City. It uh, sponsors excellence in public education in math and science. And I've worked with the teachers. Here we're using uh, this item called Zone Tool. And that's making a large object, which is a, a shadow of a four-dimensional object, uh, in the middle of Central Park um, as a, a fun activity. Um, I'm just going to take a, a side step here to give a quick commercial. Uh, one of the things I do is I'm an organizer of the annual conference called the Bridges Conference. So that Bridges is actually separate, but it means the same thing as this Bridges Lecture. That's a conference which happens to be coming here this summer. And if you like any of the things we're showing, you'll love the conference. It's just hundreds of people from around the world who celebrate mathematics and arts in different ways with lectures and workshops and videos and theater and music, etc. Um, so it's going to be July 27th through 31st. Uh, there's a website there, and I'll give you another commercial for that to remind you at the end of our talk. Um, I'm the editor for Sculpture for the uh, Journal of Mathematics and the Arts, um, and I spent four or five years creating the Museum of Mathematics in New York City, uh, designing a lot of hands-on fun things, uh, like this uh, square wheel tricycle. Um, so this is a way that you can ride on a tricycle with square wheels, but you have a perfectly smooth ride, uh, because uh, you can solve an equation that tells you the shape of the floor should be a catenary curve, which turns out to compensate for the bumps in the wheels, so you have a smooth thing. Um, so when you ride that, it kind of gives you an emotional connection to math. It says, wow, this is kind of cool, and math enabled us to do this. Math is good for fun, creative things. Uh, and that's really the philosophy behind all the things that we're going to talk about now. OK, so enough about me. I think Elizabeth should uh, click. You'll click. I click. But she's going to tell you now uh, more about how we met and how we've begun working together. Okay, so um, George and I met about three years ago at the Ontario Math Conference for Teachers. Um, he was a speaker and I was just the audience. <laughs> and uh, we started talking about, um, about education and even though George um, mainly worked in universities and with high school students, and I mainly worked with primary students, we had a lot of commonalities and a lot of um, the same ideas about making math visible, making uh, beautiful objects that, that inspire kids. And we thought, how can we work together and inspire students? So the first thing was George came into my classroom, where he's now famous as Mr. George. <laughs> and uh, um, I think he was very reluctant at first. He thought, little kids can't do these things. <laughs> um, but quickly found out otherwise. And, um, yeah, so Elizabeth kind of opened my eyes that many of these things that I had been thinking you can only do at higher levels, uh, you can translate in some form uh, to all different uh, levels and, and get more people excited about math, especially in the lower grades where you need it. Um, so reciprocally, then, I invited Elizabeth to come to Stony Brook. Uh, she took a year of absence from teaching and was a visiting scholar at the university. And I introduced her to big kids at the university. Uh, we designed a whole bunch of uh, activities, some of which we tried out at the university, and some of which uh, we traveled around to various conferences and other places. Uh, I think that's your turn to say. <laughs> so uh, we were sponsored by Math for America um, to go into New York City schools, inner city schools, uh, to work with their teachers. and, and the students. So we did workshops for teachers and then we went to those teachers' classrooms and worked with the students. So that was really amazing and eye-opening. Um, if you don't know the system in the U.S., it's really quite something. <laughs> but then we, we also traveled around um, the U.S. going to different universities and uh, conferences and made, you know, had workshops like this one, the Wiggly Dome, which we will tell you about later. Okay, so after working together for a while, we sort of sat back and tried to figure out what, what exactly is our, our mission in life? What do we consider important? Um, and what is it we're trying to accomplish by making these things? They're not just toys for kids to play with, but they, they have a, a bigger purpose. Um, so I think we're going to try and explain our mission in terms of some observations that we've come to. Um, the first observation uh, is that math is really beautiful. Okay, People who are professional mathematicians who learn about math, uh, they spend their life 
really creating beautiful things. There's an aesthetic to what's a, you know, a beautiful theorem or an elegant proof, and, and a lot of what you learn as a, an undergraduate in, in graduate school in mathematics uh, is to appreciate that aesthetic that's passed on uh, from generation to generation of mathematicians. And the public doesn't have much of a clue. The public tends to think math is like arithmetic, and I hate that stuff, and math might be algebra and trigonometry, and I heard that there's some calculus. And that's just, I mean, it's really important, but it's just a narrow, narrow, tiny fraction of 1% of what mathematicians do. Uh, so part of our mission is just to get people to understand that math is more than what they see in school. Um, and if you hate counting or adding or whatever it is that they tell you math is, that's okay. You might still like actual math if you just give it a chance. So if we can get people just not to hate math, what they, arithmetic, uh, that's already a great accomplishment. We can somehow change our culture to get people to be open-minded towards math. Oh, and I should mention, this is a catenary, as is that. A catenary is just a beautiful curve. It's got this aesthetic naturalness to it. Um, and you know, with some calculus or integral calculus, you can sort of understand what it is and why. Um, but it has an innate beauty. I think there's something universal about that shape. You know, it's used for this wonderful arch in San Francisco. If you've ever been there, we had been there, and that's what inspired us to sort of create St. our own. St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis, thank you, with those best <laughs> cities. Um, and um, anyway. So that's uh, an example of trying to take a mathematical idea and making the beauty of it tangible. So we've gone to a lot of classrooms in different countries and we've noticed that language is everywhere. You look around a classroom and there are posters, there are you know, manifestations of how beautiful language is and there are plays going on and there are books to be read and there's you know, um, poetry and all these things are, are, are available and they entice students to learn, to want to learn to read. Students want to learn to read because they know there are great books out there to be read. But the same thing isn't really true of math. And, um, and one of our missions is to, 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 to find ways to, to showcase math in that way, to show students that there's so much more to math, that it should be visible. It shouldn't just be, you know, um, what kind of work do you see on walls when it comes to mathematics is, you know. A worksheet equation. A worksheet or something like that. Um, we really want to bring out the beauty and, and, and have children and older students look forward to these things. So there's a reason to learn all the tedious stuff in math, if you find it tedious, um, because they're beautiful things to be, to be seen and to be understood. Um, another observation is that uh, you don't have to understand everything the first time you see it. Uh, it's perfectly fine to introduce a topic that is just uh, a casual way of getting acquainted to it. Um, here's a student who uh, uses Zone Tool product uh, to make uh, what turns out to be a hypercube. It's a, it's a model of a four-dimensional analog to a cube. He doesn't have to know about four-dimensional or higher-dimensional geometry um, to come up with something like that uh, to fully appreciate it. Uh, he can see certain things about it, that structure can sort of be in his mental inventory of interesting things, and if later in life, in other contexts, things like this come up, uh, he already has a, a reference point for beginning to understand it. In the same way, you don't have to be able to do the integral calculus to know why a catenary curve is exactly that shape, to appreciate it. Um, but if you're familiar with it, and later you see a catenary, uh, there's less to learn. You already have something in your mind to kind of hook on this new knowledge with. Um, so part of our philosophy is to make things that are interesting, that you may see uh, at initially as just an object, but later you'll learn more about them, and it, it just sort of helps this overall uh, process of, of uh, learning in, in a slow, uh, accessible way. Um, yeah, so um, when teachers try and encourage students to study math, they often tell them, you know, you're going to need math in the world, you're going to get a great job if you study math, you need math to do your taxes, you know, it's really important that you learn math. Um, what people don't often think about is what a great social equalizer math is, um, how much it con builds confidence in other areas of your life. Because math has this aura, and students really think that if, if only they were 
good at math, that would mean they're a good student. Students really believe that. If they're good at math, they're a good student. So if we can make students believe that, then they will shine in everything they do. And, um, and finding ways to do that, to, to give students that confidence that everyone can be good at math. It's not a select few and it's not a club that you can only enter if you have, you know, the brain power to do so. Um, it's important, it's, it's an important confidence builder and yeah. <laughs> um, another thing we discovered is that uh, teachers like having rich content and new things. So. Um, Many teachers are kind of stuck in this world of worksheets and testing and stuff, and uh, if we can create something kind of fun, it's not just exciting to get their students excited, but it's also exciting for them. You know, they want something new and something different. Um, and we found, especially at the elementary level, there's many teachers who are not themselves very confident with math. The ones who really love math often teach at the upper grades. Um, so that they themselves have a kind of math anxiety, um, and they're not sure what they should teach. So, by, uh, so Sort of writing out lesson plans as we've done and uh, ideas on how you can introduce these and, and tie them into the, the curriculum and use them uh, in a math class or in a math club or once a week to sort of get the students excited. Um, we're producing something that teachers have uh, see a value in. Yes, and like George said, <laughs> teachers do have a lot of anxiety, especially in the elementary grades, because they never really take math courses themselves. And uh, so that anxiety, of course, gets passed on. And they cling to the textbook, and they try and, and get by. But um, they themselves are not joyful when they're doing math. A lot of teachers aren't. Um, so if we can bring some of that excitement to teachers, I think it'll just spread on to their students. Okay, so that's sort of our motivation. So what have we actually done that we can sort of tell you about? Uh, well, we have a website called makingmathvisible.com. You can write that down. Or later at the end of our talk, you can pick up one of these cards and uh, has it written on the back. Uh, and this website has on it right now about 20 different activities, and our plan is to continue extending it. And they have to make some cool things that we're going to tell you a little bit about. Um, so our intention is that teachers or people who run music museum workshops or homeschoolers or just you, anyone who wants to do something kind of cool can go there. Uh, the website has everything free. It's uh, sort of like lesson plans and materials lists and templates for what to print out and cut, etc. Um, for these things. And I think what we want to do now is just spend a couple of minutes on each of these to, to give you kind of a flavor of uh, what they're about. Um, so we do a lot of paper constructions because um, paper is cheap and uh, easily readily available to to people. And and uh, if you just download a template, you can cut out some pieces and make something cool. And there's a cool little puzzle here. Um, some of them look easier than they are, but in this case, we went into a, a school in New York and. Uh, a school where students were not very enthusiastic about math, um, but then they started building and, and really enjoying themselves and having this amazing product in the end that they could talk about and then take home and tell their young siblings about. They all wanted to take a kid home to teach you know, their family. Um, of course, they always make great hats. Everybody always wants to wear everything as a hat. Um, yeah, so some excited students at the end of, of this workshop. Okay, here's another workshop. This is made out of CDs. Uh, it's actually the shape of some mathematicians call a truncated icosahedron. It's a polyhedron known for thousands of years. Um, you know it as a soccer ball, perhaps. And uh, you can take CDs and overlap them and run cable ties through them and make structures. So uh, <clears throat> the full workshop involves first uh, doing some drawing to first understand the structure, so to draw a picture of it in perspective and talk about perspective, then to create uh, this object. And then once you have the basic technique, there's a whole range of other shapes you can build. Basically, you're using CDs as a kind of a, a Lego for building things. Um, you can use recycled CDs or get shiny ones, and it becomes a kind of a centerpiece. Uh, part of our philosophy is that you can create cool things that then students will display to the rest of the school, to their family, they can talk about it. Uh, it's a way for them to kind of say, I made that thing, and now I can explain it because uh, math is something important to me. I can tell you about this. I know things about this that I can explain to my parents uh, about how many CDs it takes or how many corners or, or whatever um, to, to sort of increase the math culture in the, in the environment. 
And uh, so you do this in groups, and uh, it's kind of fun. <laughs> so this is a balloon workshop that we haven't written up. Uh, we're not quite sure if we like it. George likes it. Um, so if you have a group of students that have done a lot of playing with balloons, then uh, it works really well, and they can do this amazing, you know, Stravinsky's tetrahedron out of balloons. But we found that going into uh, certain schools where kids have never seen balloons or have never played with them, um, you tend to get, you know, can you make me a dog? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to make this really cool dodecahedron, but no, but can you really make me a dog, please? <laughs> so it's a it's a tricky one. Yeah. So this is very much a research project where where we're doing research actively, figuring out how to make things work, and then trying to document the, the benefits of our research. Um, so this is a construction made out of playing cards, twelve playing cards. Uh, on the left, you can see the individual cards are all the same. They're folded. They have uh, some slots of the right lengths and angles, so they make a little construction kit. That uh, result is a kind of a star on the right. It's much, much harder than it looks. This is a great puzzle. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned that uh, we love to give students puzzles and make them suffer a while trying to work on it to build up that perseverance of solving. It's an enormously important skill um, to be able to work on something where you have no idea what the solution is, not to give up, keep trying until you, uh, you know, come up with something and then have this wonderful aha. And of course, we give hints along the way so people aren't frustrated. Um, What's also interesting is that it's basically a cube. It doesn't look like a cube, but the 12 pieces uh, join like the 12 edges of a cube. That basically three edges come together at a corner and there's a cycle of four around. This is what mathematicians say it's isomorphic to the cube. It has a structural parallel. So it's a great way to talk about isomorphisms in a non-threatening way, but to get people to think the way mathematicians think, that when you look at something, the surface isn't really what's interesting. It's the pattern and structure. And if that pattern and structure appears in other objects, uh, then anything you know about one of them suddenly tells you something about all of them. And that's sort of the essence of how mathematicians see the world. Um, and you can convey that uh, during this kind of workshop. Um, another great thing about this one is that uh, once you've built them, so every student builds their own, um, then they discover naturally that they go together, that they become a kind of a building block and a larger structure that they can play with. So it, it leads to exploration. And we, we love when uh, we can present something which is sort of a step-by-step -step craft activity, but then they can take it in their own personal directions. Zone tool. We love zone tool. We don't have chairs in the company. But uh, this is zone tool. It's a construction kit that is wonderful at any age. Um, I like to just dump it out on the floor in my classroom and kids start making things and they start learning about geometric shapes by building them and the pieces naturally come together and that hypercube you saw before that just came about, nobody told that boy to make a hypercube or how to do it. It just happened and um, you can click. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, you can have a more structured kind of activity like making the Sapinski tetrahedron again to learn about recursion. And um, there's a zonahedron in the background. This thing that George is going to tell you about. Uh, that thing is a, a polytoke. So, um, one of the wonderful things that I love about the zone tool is it happens to have the right lengths and angles to make a whole series of objects that are three dimensional shadows of four dimensional objects that are interesting. There's a, a series of uh, four dimensional polytopes, they're called, that are generalizations of polyhedra um, that are wonderful and beautiful and elegant. Um, and high school students love learning about four dimensional geometry. It's some way of like rebelling against our three dimensional world and reading flatland, etc. Uh, this is a wonderful tool for introducing uh, these shapes. This is something called 120 cells made of 120 uh, regular dodecahedra packed together in four space. Um, and it all, they also have a, a wonderful beauty to them. So it turns out that uh, these family of objects have lovely shadows. You can take the four dimensional object, take its shadow as a three dimensional kind of sculpture, and then the shadow of that down to a two dimensional object has a great deal of structure that you can see uh, in that particular shadow outside there. And of course, you can make amazing, cool bubbles as a tool. Um, these are cubicle bubbles that the students have made. They've made a cube as a framework and dipped the cube into a bubble solution and came out with this cube bubble that is related to the hypercube. Um, but you can make all kinds of other shapes. 
Can you can make a dodecahedron bubble. If you've never done that, that's, uh, that's your homework. Okay. Um, okay, this is a pencil sculpture of mine, 72 pencils glued together, uh, that we use as a basis for a workshop. Uh, this one isn't written up on our website yet, but we'll get to it. Um, where uh, you put the pencils together using rubber bands instead of glue. And uh, it's a great exercise because the pencils, instead of going along like perpendicular X, Y, Z directions, there's four different directions. They correspond to the four diagonals of a cube. Um, getting uh, sort of a mental ability to see those directions and how to put things in uh, develops just sort of kind of a visual thinking and spatial reasoning, which is so important uh, in, in many, many fields and puzzles. So many of our activities are, are designed to just sort of give you a spatial challenge that can be kind of fun and physical. And uh, you can also do it with chopsticks and with uh, lots of people, if you like. Speaking of chopsticks, um, here is the hyperboloid that we have here. We make it out of chopsticks or um, skewers. And then you can make a much bigger one out of um, dowels, or I've always wanted to make one out of broomsticks. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can uh, so it's a curved surface that is made of straight lines, and uh, students have to follow a pattern to make it. It looks simple, but surprisingly, a lot of people get it wrong. Um, kids that have in, uh, experience with long hair and rubber uh, hair bands are much faster at this. Um, here are some teachers making the hyperboloid. And then, of course, we make everything bigger because if it's bigger, it's even cooler and you can go inside of it. And, so. <laughs> and this is something that happens a lot after our workshops is that kids then take it into different directions and they make their own extensions and then they have their own ideas of what they'd like to see next. And we get a lot of our ideas from that. Yeah, we like to get people into that spirit of play, which is so important for you know mathematical and, and scientific research. Um, I'll also mention that we have a little video at the end that the talk will show, just uh, three minutes about uh, hyperboloids, just to give you a, a sense of how we like to sort of bring some math in. So um, when we have a whole hour or more, we can bring in a lot of math thinking as we're doing it. Right now, we're just giving you a quick summary, but the video that we'll show you will, will go a little bit more into the math. Um, so this one is a kind of a, uh, it's a string ring. Uh, this is a workshop that you know, derives from a long tradition of uh, curve stitching and uh, string art in various forms. Uh, but we designed a laser cut uh, ring with some notches and numbers etched into it. Uh, and then you can do various kinds of patterns on the ring. Um, so many of our workshops, not many, but some of them, a uh, quarter of them maybe, involve using a laser cutter. So um, laser cutters are really becoming ubiquitous. They're, they're um, in the US and upper level schools, everyone has a laser cutter now and the prices are coming down. In 10 years, there'll be laser cutters everywhere. And once you have a laser cutter, it costs nothing practically in terms of materials to make interesting things. So a number of our workshops, uh, we have the templates online. Uh, just find a laser cutter near you and you know, for a few pennies you could, of materials, you can make uh, the actual objects. Um, the math here for uh, middle schoolers would involve basically counting and modulo arithmetic. Uh, there's some interesting things you can do that involve uh, you know, greatest common uh, divisors, and et cetera. Um, uh, at that level, we, we do this workshop first with paper and then stringing. Uh, but for older students, you can also do uh, more advanced ones and larger ones. So here, the separate pieces are, are marks that are cut out, and then a bunch of those are glued together to make a ring. Uh, and then uh, this particular pattern, you connect whole number i to whole number two times i. If you do that all the way around, it turns out you get the envelope of a cardioid shape. Um, and with uh, other variations on that simple, sort of algebraic formulas as to what do I connect to what, uh, there's a whole family of, of interesting curves that you can get and you can discuss at, at different levels. Uh, so, um, one of my favorite workshops, um, this is a workshop we've done with teachers and uh, um, university students, but also with younger grades. I do this with my students at the beginning of every year. Um, it's, a, it's a puzzle. Uh, designed by Danish uh, designer Pete Heine in the 1930s. Um, and basically, we have there are seven pieces to this puzzle, and you put them together. They look a lot like Tetris. So a lot of kids who play Tetris are really good at this. Um, but we have them puzzle out the pieces first. So they have to make the pieces out of little wooden cubes. 
Um, and once they have seven pieces, they have to put them together first into a cube. And it's an amazing activity for young kids because there are 240 different ways to put together the cube. So you can imagine there's a high success rate and you get that aha moment really quickly and so then they're hooked and they just want to do all the other shapes that are much more difficult actually. They want to do the dog and the dinosaur, but then of course we make it bigger and it's a great activity to, you know, um, for proportional reasoning because they have to make the pieces much bigger and then it's a really fun thing to interact with. And we would have had one today, but it didn't fit into our car. <laughs> we really wanted to have it for you today. And of course, you can make it even bigger and walk through it if you make the arch. Uh, this is a cardboard sculpture, so I showed some metal sculptures before. If you don't have the budget for that, for $50 worth of cardboard, you can cut out pieces with the saw um, and make uh, really interesting things. Uh, it's a real puzzle challenge and involves thinking about symmetry and rotations and understanding a pattern and extending that pattern to add the next pieces. Um, for this version, uh, we put the pieces together with the black binder clamps, build the sculpture, then one at a time, take off the clamp, brush some glue in the flap, put the clamp back on. After the glue dries, uh, you have the sculpture, you can hang it up and it becomes a real centerpiece, a real way of emphasizing uh, you know, the importance of mathematics that you can put in a public space and, and show the beauty of mathematics. Oops. Oops. Uh, we have four dome workshops. Um, domes are really popular with young kids. They know domes really well because they've climbed them their whole life. So they have this intimate connection with domes. Uh, and uh, first we make a paper dome and then click. We, um, they naturally, kids just naturally had to make this, know how to make this shape, it's amazing. They just go ahead and make a dome and then of course they like to trap their teacher. Um, here it's uh, a dome made out of laser cut wood pieces and everybody likes to go inside. <laughs> And here we're making it with students at Stony Brook University on a much bigger scale. That's the Wigby Dome you saw before. And big kids like to go inside as well. <laughs> uh, this is a catenary arch workshop. This one we have three versions. Uh, the first version is paper. There's 13 separate pieces there that you build separately. Um, and the mathematics, the physics of it means that you, the pieces will just balance and they'll hold themselves in place uh, with friction. They will fall. <laughs> Um, and then the challenge is to put it back together. Once you've done paper, you can just hand the class the pile of cardboard pieces and they'll know what to do. Oops, and then they'll, they'll build it. Uh, it's great that it involves uh, sort of collaboration. You can't build this with one person. You have to have at least two people uh, to keep it going. Uh, and then we have a large wood version of this laser cut wood and cable ties that makes something. This one is uh, big enough for adults to walk through. There you can see it as sort of the, uh, the magic gateway into the, uh, the reading corner of Elizabeth's class. Uh, the Brombic Tricontrahedron puzzle is right here. We did bring that one for you. Uh, this one's made of laser cut wood. Um, and uh, it's something that kids love to play with. And they play with it so much, they totally know the Brombic Tricontrahedron. They can recognize it in the wild. They know its name. Um, I think sometimes we don't give enough credit to kids to, to learn these things and to learn the names and to recognize them. Um, they, they, you know, they love learning the names of dinosaurs and they love identifying them. So why not identify geometric shapes and, and know how they work and how they're put together. Uh, this puzzle has 20 pieces. They're all slanted cubes, so they come together in an unusual way, five at a corner. Um, here's a paper version that's in a plastic shell. We have that one, yeah. There are teachers making it. <laughs> And when you add color, then there's a, a, an extra level to the puzzle because, um, well, if you want to come and make it, we'll, we'll give you the clues. Um, and here we're, we make a great big one out of cardboard. And it's always nice to do these things on a big scale because it's a completely different activity when you're making something with other people in a physical way. It's, it just becomes a really, you know, fun thing to do. So, and then you have a conversation piece um, that kids love to talk about. 
Um, this one isn't written up, but uh, we have a series of sculptures that uh, you can make. Uh, this is laser cut wood held together with cable ties. Um, uh, this will be written up, we hope, within a month as we gradually find time to document these. Um, again, it's a fun uh, challenge geometric puzzle to figure out how the parts go together. Um, oops, and it does involve a lot of uh, sort of puzzle solving thinking. And uh, we'll probably have a series of four different sculptures uh, when we're all done, is our, our vision for that part. Okay, so is this stuff any good? What do you think? <laughs> I don't know. We get a lot of student comments after we visit a classroom. We usually get stacks of letters mailed to us, handwritten letters that are just wonderful. And, um, and it really encourages us to keep going and keep doing these things. Yeah, so we haven't done any formal before and after double-blind controlled experiments to, to assess this, but we have kind of an emotional surety that we're doing something right. There's something good about this that we want to sort of share with the world in some way. And of course, we wouldn't come here without, you know, showing you all these wonderful things and not giving you a chance to do one like George will do. So now it's your turn. So we have so an activity for you guys to do. So you're going to get a little bag that you're going to share with your neighbor because I'm not sure how many people we have, but... Yeah, okay. one bag for two people, probably. Work as, a, work as a team of two. So take some and pass them down. Oh. two people, more or less. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Desks have a little desk oh, you can bring up, yes. Yeah. So that'll okay. be helpful. Okay, so they're still passing them out. Um, and just kind of spread them around. We have 100 kits, and you're about 150 people, maybe? I don't know exactly. Um, so there's, there's one for every two people, and some extras. If you really want to work alone, that's fine. But it's more fun to work together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to want to have a partner to make it easier. I'll do that. So, we haven't told you what to do, so it's okay not to succeed yet. <laughs> so, don't try to make this, for example. That won't work. I don't think we have a mic anymore. Yeah. You still have a mic? Come on. Okay, raise your hand if nothing came your way. If nothing came your way, raise your hand. And if you have extra ones that, that you don't need, that too many, pass them along to someone else who's raising their hand. Okay, so let me tell you a brief introduction to what you're doing. Um, there's a family of objects called polylinks. Um, these are polylinks. Those are polylinks. Uh, they involve polygons that instead of joining edge to edge, like in a cube, you put squares edge to edge, instead they, they link together. So this is the same object. Those two pictures are this square polylink as seen from different angles. From some perspective, it's really simple. It just looks like you know planes at right angles and squares. From other perspectives, it can be kind of confusing. Uh, what we're going to do is have you guys make something which from some perspective, is really simple, but from others is really confusing. But we think the process of having you build it uh, will be helpful. Uh, so this is one you're not going to make. Um, <laughs> but the instructions are on our website. You just need these big popsicle sticks. Um, and this is what you have. Your materials in front of you should have how many? 12, 12 sticks. sticks and 12 little clips. Um, and it's called the four triangle puzzle. So that's your first hint. Can you solve the four triangle puzzle? Is that Start enough? Playing. Is that enough information to solve the puzzle? So you may have noticed that we like symmetry, we like regularity and patterns. So 
instead of having four triangles sort of randomly on the floor or whatever, uh, you're going to want to have four triangles that are structured in some nice way. Here's another hint. Each triangle is one color. <laughs> So if you can make a blue triangle and a red triangle and a yellow triangle and a green triangle, um, that'll be a good step along the way. So remember we said they're poly links. <laughs> Just one color. Did you not get a kit? Are you missing? Yeah, we were missing the nails. You, there were no nails? Yeah. <laughs> what? Quality control department is not up to speed. We, we have extra pieces and uh, we'll let you have some. <laughs> of these and then give me back the bag. All right, thank you. Okay, if you're missing uh, one of those little brass fasteners, we have spares, and for some reason we miscounted. So we packed a hundred of these bags. I think we deserve some applause just for that. <laughs> okay, so we're going to give you another hint now, I sure. think. Whoa, that's a big one. The hint is we like symmetry. We like symmetry. So now you know what a triangle is. Okay, so, you, you want to say? Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay, so if you look at this picture carefully, and if you look at your triangles, you may see that it matches or you may see something different. Um, look at your triangle and look at the picture and tell us, say uh, we're different. Yeah, so you need to... I know, to I understand, but this won't work. So this won't work. Because we like symmetry, can everybody hear me? Because we like symmetry, we made our triangle have I mean, a actually kind of rotational point. symmetry. That you want to have every two triangles, no matter which two you pick, blue and yellow or red and green, follow the pattern that's shown there. Geometrically, they're not just linked, like two links of a chain, but they're pushed together in a way uh, so that the midpoint of the edge of one sits inside the corner of another. So on the left, you see the blue midpoint there is inside the yellow corner, and vice versa like on the right. Like this. That's going to be the relationship between every pair of yeah. triangles. No matter which two triangles you look at, they go that way. So you can start by holding two that way, and one person can hold it, and then your partner can add a third one, trying to make it relate like that to one of the first two, and then you have to add a fourth one that relates to all of them. And it's a puzzle. It's a tangle. But it can be done. And I've seen at least one solution. You want to work two people yeah. together. One at a time. Is this good? Yes, very good. And you'll need someone to hold it for you so that you can Can put the next one. one. No, nope. they're, they're, they're in a tight little ball because every pair of links. So if they were stretched out, these two wouldn't link. Okay, oh, okay. So every two links. Every two links. In one structure. So start with two that are linked as in the picture, and then add a third one that links with both of them. Oh, yeah. You know, there's a bag on that. I'll get it. That's okay. That's good. <laughs> So those two are correct. After you have two like that, try to get a third one in that links around one of them in that same way, but it also links around the other one in that same way. So every pair looks like that picture if you remove the other two. 
So these are three right, you just have to get a fourth one. Keep going, that's good. <laughs> you may find it easier to add one stick at a time after the first two triangles together, rather than making a whole separate triangle and joining it. But see whatever works. So this is perfect. You have three together in the right way. It's not perfect yet. Okay. And my hands are a little small. If I push this in like this and hold it tight. Oh, you can join this one. Oh, that one just fell out. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Then... So we think inside of each one. corner, there's an edge. Inside of, so, so if you have a corner without an edge inside it, you can put a stick in there so you do have an edge inside that corner. Yes. And you agree? And it can be done. Yes. Here's an example of what you're trying to make. In the end, every pair is linked. No matter which two you take, they look like that picture. Yay. Thank you. 
And the challenge is to get the third one in there. It's going to have to go through here, through here, and through the blue one to make a triangle. So you need one in here, one in here, and one in there. So adding the sticks one at a time. Okay, so We're almost there. I could see there's nothing through this blue. Okay. So you need one in there. There's nothing through this red. Yeah. And there's nothing through this yellow. So somehow the three sticks are going to have to go. You may want to take out one of those pieces and do it. Okay. Uh, one stick at a time. Okay. So. So this is green take three. And what we need is to have something through here, something through here, and something through this yellow so you know so you that one midpoint is going to have to go that all together corner, at once. Right? You can do it with two, but you put one stick so in here, one in here. Another take one. this edge here. Sure we do. I'll get it for you. Put that against this corner. The connected one. Where would the rest of the time? So you want? I think you want to take this off and, and you know that one stick at a time. That corner has to. Or at most two sticks at a time. Be on the outside of this. So and you want to come through here and here, for example, from your side. Okay, uh, well, and that's uh, if you're going to go that way, you can come into the yellow and the blue. You want one in there, and, and one, one through this blue corner. I'm saying that there's nothing in there. And somehow you're going to have to get one, one more, more that goes in through this red corner to join them up as a triangle. And you may have to adjust them slightly. Okay. No, no, no. Time wise, we kind of lost a little. Should I wrap up in 10 minutes? We could wrap up in 10 minutes. Sure. Okay. So there's the two videos and think, right? Yeah. Okay. We'll be quick with them. Okay. We'll come back and help you. Okay. I'm going to interrupt and say I wish we had another 20 minutes because then we could really get into this depth. It seems like about a dozen or more people have solved it and that's good. Others are almost there and I really want to walk around and help everybody and I will stay here as late as you guys want until every single person has a solve while we go out into the snack person. But we're going to have to wrap up in this room before too long. So we're going to continue showing you some things. Don't get frustrated. But, uh, also pay attention to us a little bit. Um, so very briefly, maybe we should say that in the future we want to continue designing more of these activities, document them. Uh, we'd like to have 40 or more so that you could do one a week in a kind of a math club or in a math class. Um, you want to say more? Or? One of our fantasies is to have math libraries and schools. You know how you can take books out of the library. It would be wonderful to have a math library, a math lending center where you can take out puzzles, where kids can go and play with puzzles, read math books, just hang out and, and have a space where they can think and be quiet or you know work together and, and take out objects that they work with at home, like kids like these. Just... It's a fantasy. Okay. Um, we want to show you two quick videos um, to, to kind of wrap up, and then we'll take questions. Uh, the first video has to do with uh, hyperboloids uh, to give you a flavor of how you can uh, take an object like this and scale it up and lead you to other projects. Uh, so take a listen at this. And again, we might want the lights lower for the videos. Can a curved surface in three dimensions be made entirely of straight lines? Well, yes. A cylinder is a curved surface, and there's a straight line through every point. But a cylinder is straight in one direction, so it's easy to see its lines. Can a doubly curved surface, like a saddle, be made of straight lines? Surprisingly, yes. Just twist these discs to tilt the connecting strings. You find that between the two extremes of a cylinder and a double cone, there's a continuous range of surfaces like an hourglass, called hyperboloids, and they're entirely made of straight lines. In fact, for any amount of turn in one direction, you could also turn the same amount in the other direction to make the same hyperboloid. This means the surface has two straight lines through every point. It's a beautiful form. Can you imagine making one large enough to walk through? We'll warm up by using shish kebab skewers for our lines and small ponytail rubber bands to join them. 
It's wonderful how an initially disorganized mess begins to structure itself into such a natural form. Because the crossings are movable, the final result is dynamic. It flexes beautifully, should you want that. But let's try a different trick. You can compress it from the sides to change the circular cross-section into an elliptical form. The sticks tilt, but stay straight. That's because if you stretch or compress uniformly in one direction, you map circles into ellipses, but lines remain lines. So the resulting elliptic hyperboloid is still made of straight lines, though it's more interesting visually. Our plan is to proportion it and sink it into the ground to make an arbor way for people to walk through. We'll practice with some scrap bamboo to get a sense of the engineering challenges at full scale. Flexing this model is fun, but we see we'll want to brace our structure so it doesn't flex. For the full scale version, we first decide how many lines we want. We're placing 24 pieces of 12 foot long bamboo in each direction, making two families of diagonals. This gets rolled up into a cylinder, taking care that one set of diagonals stays on the inside and the other set stays on the outside. The Everything pass. connects with heavy duty rubber bands designed for outdoor use in agricultural applications. Then the structure is stretched and compressed from a circular shape into the elliptical form. Because the sticks now have different slopes, the heights of their tops now vary. So we need to saw off the ends of the longer ones to match the height of the shortest ones. Then we add a ring around each end using pliable pieces that can curve to the shape of the ellipse. This is the bracing that prevents flexing. The plan is to rotate it so it's oriented on its side and people can walk through it. Digging the trench for it to sit in is the hardest part of the job, but when it's installed, it looks great. The result is a unique garden arborway, a triumphant arch that reminds everyone of the beauty of mathematics and how certain curved surfaces are actually composed of straight lines. Gives you a flavor of how you can... <laughs> How you can bring some math into this and also get people excited about other projects. We have another short video, another three minutes. Uh, this is actually made by Craig Kaplan, a professor here who's uh, going to be the local host of the Bridges Conference. If you like any of the things we showed you today, you will love the Bridges Conference, which is all about math and art this summer. My name is so Craig Kaplan. Roll that. My name is Craig Kaplan, and it's my pleasure to invite you to attend the Bridges 2017 conference at the University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Bridges is the world's foremost annual event on interdisciplinary connections between art and mathematics. Each year, participants from over 30 countries come together in an environment of mutual exchange and inspiration. The conference features contributed papers on new research, a series of exciting keynote talks, hands-on workshops, a visual art exhibition, and numerous events focusing on theater, poetry, music, and film. Plus, there's a family day where the public can join us to play and learn. In 2017, the conference will be hosted by the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Waterloo. Our faculty represents the largest concentration of mathematicians and computer scientists in the world. The university is modern and dynamic with about 36,000 students spread over six faculties. The Waterloo region is one of Canada's high-tech hubs with numerous startups coming out of the university and large companies like Google running local offices. Once you're in the area, you can also enjoy Mennonite culture and crafts in St. Jacobs, visit Niagara Falls in Ontario's wine region, see a show at Stratford's famous theater festival, and of course, visit Toronto. You'll also be surrounded by the Great Lakes with many beautiful spots for hiking and camping. We hope that you'll join us at the University of Waterloo July 27th to the 31st for another exciting and inspiring conference. Mathematics, music, art, architecture, culture. Bridges Waterloo 2017. At this point, I think we have time for a few questions. I'm not sure how much time. All right, so.
So I would invite uh, members of the audience to use the microphones. Uh, we'll sort of go around. Uh, before we begin, I have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, next Friday, that's February 10th, 7.30, here in the Vanstone Theater uh, is the next lecture in Catholic Experiences. The speaker is Mary Hines. She's the host of CBC Radio 1 program Tapestry, and that's entitled 52 Minutes of Silence, Finding Words for the Inexpressible. On Saturday, February 11th at 7, at 7 p.m., uh, also here in the Vanstone Theater, um, a talk by the eminent historian J.R. Miller. It's entitled Confederation and Indigenous Treaty Making in Canada, 1871 to 1921. That's a lecture co-sponsored by University of Waterloo, St. Jerome's University, and the Confederation Debates. It's a National Legacy Canada 150 history project. And finally, Wednesday, March 8th, the next Bridges Lecture will be here. It, it is entitled Platonic Solids as Tiffany Lamps, Art Objects, and Stepping Stones to Higher Dimensions. And it will be given by Berkeley Professor Carlo Sequin and New Hampshire glass artist Hans Schepker. So those are the announcements. So now let's start with Q&A, sir. We'll be happy to have our work on uh, wherever that is. <laughs> Other questions? The question I'm expecting is how do you build this triangle thing? <laughs> <laughs> you probably have other questions. Yes. Uh, how do you design your sculpture? Yeah, so that's a whole nother talk I could give on, in terms of my sculptures, but uh, they start with mathematical ideas that somehow I have to convert to a physical form. In between, I write software um, that helps me visualize and calculate you know, lengths and angles and can um, allow me to edit things and see them on the screen from different perspectives and then output the, you know, the files that go to a laser cutter or a 3D printer, etc. So there, there's a long process to my sculpture. Um, to talk about that would be like a whole other hour. <laughs> But you should come and talk to him afterwards. Oh, yeah, and I'll be yeah. around after. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't mean to ignore you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> can you demonstrate the reassembly of the neck? Oh, yes, we can. Should we? Yes. Yes, okay. Take the next okay. question while we okay. do this. <laughs> all right. And then afterwards, uh, all the stuff will be around. We're going to have you guys carried out to the lounge. And you'll get to the food. And you can play with everything, including playing with this. But here's a hint. The one that labeled A to go below the one that's labeled B. Just a little. <laughs> Maybe you'll figure out our secret system. <laughs> Yes, sir. You mentioned fourth dimensions. What's the earliest age at which you can teach a child about four dimensions, and how would you do it? Um, the book Flatland is a great story about four-dimensional geometry. I, I recommend that. Um, and that you can certainly read in middle school and get a sense of it. Um, you can learn different things. Uh, I've done workshops with uh, young high school students, and they can get a lot. You can you can learn a lot by analogy, looking at a, you know a point, a line, a square, a cube, a hypercube. Um, and there's no age that's too young to expose them to it, and to you know have it around and have them ask questions about it. You want that one? You want one of these? Take okay. quick. Okay. okay. I'm up so, yeah. Yes. Uh, what's the difference between a uh, parabola and uh, the catenary curve? Yeah, that's a great question. They're going to put this piece in, and then I'm going to tell you the answer. <laughs> that one goes here. No, that, that, that's the very middle one. Oh, the that's the one? This okay. one says G. Really? Cool. Yeah. Um, 
So the, the catenary has a certain physical property that if you slice it perpendicular to it, the forces are all exactly tangential. There's no sliding force at all, so it holds together by friction. Um, but that is not the answer to the question, was it? Um, what was the question again? What's the difference between oh, catenary and a parabola? So um, at the high school level, you can explain that a parabola is like x squared, it's a polynomial. Um, you can give the formula for a catenary. Catenary is e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. It's uh, also called a hyperbolic cosine. Um, and at that point, you can graph it and sort of see the difference. To really understand the difference, you want to think in terms of uh, asymptotics. As you go further away, a catenary, because it's an exponential, gets very, very steep, whereas a parabola uh, is like the least steep curve in some sense that goes up. Um, and having an introduction to that is really crucial for understanding many things in computer science about how certain problems as you grow get really hard and other problems don't get really hard. Uh, so the, the simplest way to explain the difference is one is a polynomial and one is an exponential curve. Um, and then uh, there's a lot more you could do, but to, to really understand kind of, you do have to have some integral calculus. I don't know a simple way uh, to explain its properties uh, without doing some integrals. Um, but I don't think that's bad. I think it's a way to get people to know that there's value to learning uh, more math as you go along. Just one. Um, the question is, what book would we recommend as a next step? Do you have a sense as a teacher? It depends um, what aspect of the talk, I guess, you're looking for. If you're as a, as a, for your children or for yourselves. For myself. <clears throat> Um, if you like zone tool, uh, I did write a book on zone tool constructions, <laughs> but, which I'm selling in the lobby. No. Uh, oh, holy mackerel! There it is. Wow, five dollars to this man later. Um, thank you very much. Um, but um, I really recommend the book by Martin Gardner. Okay, so for people of my age, sort of gray-haired, if there's any left, old mathematicians, Martin Gardner wrote a column in the 1950s, uh, which is just full of recreational mathematics uh, explained uh, with a sense for logic, not of just sort of presenting math as botany, you know, here's a shape, here's a shape, but saying this follows from this for this reason. Here's the logic for understanding why you build up an understanding from simpler things to more complex things. So the, all the books by Martin Gardner, he, he wrote hundreds of books, some are on philosophy, but the ones that have to do with either puzzles or recreational mathematics uh, are great. Some of them involve hands-on constructions, uh, some of them are just puzzles to think about. Um, I think that's the best general uh, sort of all-around uh, introduction to our philosophy of, of thinking about mathematics. Yes. Um, so earlier there was a question about 40 shapes and how do you introduce them to um, your kids. But what exactly are 40 shapes? Yeah, so to give you a whole course on 4D geometry would take a while, but the simple story is that um, you can represent points on a line with one coordinate. You can say like, what's the x value? You can represent things in a plane with an x and a y in three space with x, y, and z. We can just imagine there were things that required four coordinates. Every point has an, a w, x, y, and z. And then you can ask questions like, what's the distance between two points? And the Pythagorean theorem tells you how to find the distance between two points in a plane or in space in terms of the coordinates. You can generalize that and say, all right, so between any two points, I take the square root of the sum of the differences of the x and the y and the z and the w. Um, and now I have a measure of, if there were two of these points, how far are they? And I can say, now, a tetrahedron has four points all the same distance. Can in, in four dimensions, can I make points that are all the same distance from each other? And I can discover that there are regular, what are called polytopes, made out of shapes that have these equal distances and equal angles. And in the 1850s, um, these were first discovered and written about. Uh, at that time, it was so revolutionary that no one basically read the paper for 30 years until it was sort of rediscovered later. Um, but uh, since then, uh, people have realized that higher dimensional geometries are, in some sense, just as real as our geometry. So. Uh, you know in three dimensions that like, if I take a sphere and a plane, their intersection can be a perfect circle. Um, but there is no sphere and plane in our world. No, nothing is truly a plane. There's no sphere that's perfectly round. Uh, yet somehow we deal with this abstraction. Uh, mathematicians just deal with similar abstractions. We, we don't think that four-dimensional reality is less real because three-dimensional geometry doesn't actually exist in the sense uh, that you might think. So they're all 
part of a continuum of uh, ways of thinking of what are the logical consequences of the rules. Um, that's a kind of a short answer to something that uh, you know we could teach as a course over the, a period of a semester to give you a good flavor of it by building some models, by looking in terms of coordinates, by looking in terms of axioms and theorems. Um, and it's it's a advanced topic in some sense, but it is something that you can approach uh, from uh, you know starting in middle school. You can introduce some of these ideas. Yes. Um, I'm also an artist, and I'm an elementary school teacher teaching math and using a lot of art just intuitively in my math lessons. I wanted to know just a practical question. On your website, when you offer these ideas, is there something around the math talk afterwards? So, you know, you're constructing, and you said there's curriculum connections, but what about that math talk that needs to happen? I teach grade five, six, so the math talk that needs to happen after, I mean, you're explaining four dimensions and I'm like not understanding a thing. So if I'm building these things with my children, how am I having that conversation afterwards? Is, the, is that there for me? So you can have as much math talk as fits into your curriculum, into your grade, for example, and you can add something that might not be in the curriculum, like talking about isomorphism is something that grade fives can understand. You know, if you compare your toes and your fingers, they're isomorphic to each other. Um, and, and the same thing is true if you make this. You can really see the cube underneath. You can see that this is related to a cube, isomorphic to a cube. I guess um, what I'm wondering is, are those hints, are those things that I should be seeing? Like, in other words, when I look at that initially, I didn't see the cube, but now that you mention it. So right. are those hints and those ideas presented there to help me to know so what to So on the website, should? they are. Yeah, okay. yeah. So everything is explained, and you can take as much as you want from it and adapt it to the level you're teaching. Um, and I think it's always good to introduce a little bit more and to give them a little bit more. Um, and often, them. often they give you that little bit more. Exactly, and, and you know, that, that's what's so exciting about teaching. And I had hoped uh, to do that today with these constructions that you made. So uh, ideally, after you build it, we should spend 20 minutes or more looking at it and trying to really understand it and to see it. Um, there's some beautiful things in this structure. Um, I didn't get to say, but you know, mathematicians have been building things with triangles for 2,000 years. Um, and there's a beautiful structure made out of four triangles called a tetrahedron. You all know, it's got like a triangle base and three triangle sides to make a pyramid. Um, it wasn't until around 1970 that anyone discovered the structure that you just built. Okay? It's amazing that 2,000 years of mathematicians thinking of everything that came with triangles, no one thought that you can put four triangles together in this way. Uh, and professional mathematicians were really surprised uh, to find this. Like, it's a new thing that's so simple. It's elegant. Um, if we had time, I would ask you to kind of look at it and would develop some characteristics of it, but you might notice the triangles are concentric. The center of each of the four triangles is the same point in space. Um, you might notice the triangles are not orthogonal, but they're at a kind of an angle to each other. That angle turns out to be the same as the angle between two faces of a regular tetrahedron, and we can talk about why. Um, because they're at an angle, it means you could tilt it a little bit right or left. It means that there's a left hand and a right hand form. Do we have them here? The two, you can build this in two different ways out of mirror images. Um, so half of you built one, and half of you built the other. And if we had more time, I would be very curious to try and have you figure out which is which, and to find out in a large group, because we've never done this before. You're the first people to do this. Um, are most of you, like, because you're right-handed, do they come out one way or the other? I have no idea. The interesting science experiment. Um, so there, there's a lot more we could talk about these if there was time, and that kind of consolidation after doing a workshop is, this on your is important. Uh, yes. Yeah. So th this is on our website, so if you want more help with it, uh, yeah. Yeah. Go, go to our makingmathvisible.com website. Uh, yes, sir. Have you ever seen this? I have, heard, I have heard that somewhere on Long Island, there's a library that has a geometric sculpture. Uh, could you tell us where we could go to see that? and who the sculptor was. This sounds like a plant question, perhaps. But, uh, uh, I do have a, a large geometric sculpture in uh, Northport, New York. It's made out of, uh, it looks like books, but they're made out of wood. Um, if I gave you a sculpture talk, I would give you um, uh, sort of an example of that and other sculptures around. 
I'm trying to think. What's my Kingston nearest sculpture? Kingston would be the closest. Kingston. My sculpture, I have a, skin a sculpture in Kingston at uh, Queen's University. No, at, at Queen's University. At Queen's yeah. University. Or the one in uh, Michigan might be close as a, I mean, but a different no country. But you don't want to visit that. a country that would do what that country did recently. Um, so... Um, Anyway, so uh, yes, if you happen to be in New York at Long Island, but I have, I was counting recently over 100 sculptures sort of around the world and, and public sculptures in different places. Um, and uh, my website talks about that. That's uh, a different talk. Okay, question over there. Me? Yes, go ahead. Um, sorry, <laughs> was that a little loud? Um, so I'm in grade four, and I was wondering how I could talk about how 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 can I get sorry how I could talk to my class about this. Hmm. Just what's just the, wondering. What to you is the most interesting or important thing you learned today? I don't know. It was all pretty interesting and important. <laughs> answer. If you, if you could take one thing to your class, what would it be? If you could explain one object to your class, which one would you pick? I'd probably try to explain the hyperboloid because it's it's um, it's you can compress it and it's 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 a very um, nice shape. I don't know. I, I think I'm just talking weird stuff now. Your homework <laughs> is to take that to your class. Um, so one thing you can tell your class is that it's made of straight lines, but it's curved. And for people to think about, is that a contradiction? That that is sort of a mind-blowing thing in some sense. That something curved could be made of straight lines. So maybe that's a start. And then you can ask your friends or your teacher if they've seen that shape out in the world. Where do you see that shape? Do you know any buildings that are that shape? It's Okay, another question over there. What's your favorite shape that you've made? <laughs> What's your favorite shape? I my think mine is the rhombic tri no, tricontahedron. You can't have that one. That's mine. I, I happen to love the shape. I, I can't tell you why. It's just a personal aesthetic thing. But um, you can study this for years and keep discovering new connections between it and other things. Um, and it's really fun pretty. to make. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll take one last question. Uh, these are um, all regular geometry. Is there a, a variable quality to the length? So the question is, uh, these are all regular in some sense, and can we make other things that are more variable? Is that the question, more or less? Um, so I think the answer is, yes, we can make all kinds of things. We've chosen a small subset of things that, uh, just based on our intuition, we think are good for introducing different topics. So uh, the notion of symmetry and regularity uh, are sort of important issues that you can bring out. Um, if we had more time to create hundreds of workshops, I think you'd see a, a variety of other things. You'd see other types of geometry. So these are all fit in, in what a mathematician would call Euclidean geometry. Uh, there are topics of uh, hyperbolic geometry, for example, where there's other rules for how you build things uh, that you could introduce in workshops. Um, Four-dimensional geometry is sort of another family of things that we could do more with. Um, so we've only had time to, to do all this like between all the other things that we actually do. <laughs> so uh, we are perhaps at the beginning of a, a longer project that will include uh, more variety. Okay. So um, our speakers are going to be around for a little while. So if you have more questions, please feel free to uh, approach them. Uh, before we break, I have one last announcement. And that is that you probably have noticed when you walked in in the foyer, there's this beautiful book. Um, it is a... Um, in a glass display. It is a, a volume of the Gospels and Acts of the St. John's Bible, and it's, it was first completely written in the illuminated Bible since the invention of the printing press more than 500 years ago. Uh, it's a journey through history with a modern twist, magnified images of viruses under the microscope, strains of DNA images from the Hubble telescope, and woven, or they're all woven into um, illuminations. So uh, please 
Feel free to have a look at that as well. We will have, we have a reception waiting for you outside. Uh, but before we go, please join me in thanking George and Elizabeth for a wonderful <laughs> And again, we'll stay and help you make your triangles all night if that's what it takes. Or if you've done one, help someone else.